So today we have the pleasure of having Katie Gittins from Durham University, and she will speak about upper bounds for stack club eigenvalues. The stage is yours, Katie. Thank you very much, Alexandre and Jean, for the invitation. Um, so yeah, thank you all of you also out there for, for listening in today. So I should say that um, I, I have on full screen, so I can't see you or the chat. So um, Alexandre and Jean kindly have uh, agreed to keep an eye on that. So if you would like to post any question in there, um, please do. Um, but hello, hello everybody, wherever, wherever you are. Hello from Durham and good evening from here. And um, today I'm going to talk to you about some joint work with Bruno Colbois. And um, it's about step club eigenvalues. And um, if you would be interested to, to look in any more detail, we have a preprint available on the archive at the moment um, with identifier here. And uh, then we put up a new version, actually it appeared this morning for me and I don't know what time it is for you, but it was this morning UK time. So uh, feel free to have a look there later. If you've got any um, comments or, or remarks or questions, we'd be happy uh, to hear them and please, please uh, drop us an email. So, right, so I'm going to uh, talk about um, upper bounds for stack club eigenvalue, so a somewhat general, general title. Um, so my plan is to, to uh, eventually arrive at these results with, with Bruno, um, but first of all, I'd like to uh, recall for you some results from the literature, which will give some motivations and some context for the results that I present later. Um, so obviously, well, I, my apologies that it's not a complete list of all of all of the possible bounds that that there are. Um, it's rather a a selection of um, results that either inspired us or um, were um, most uh, related to to what I'll present today. Um, and in that vein as well, I know we've had a great many talks um, of excellent talks already about about step club eigenvalues and some as well that mentioned the, the bounds for two dimensions of so surfaces. Um, here, the results that I'll talk about will hold for surfaces as well, but the focus is more on, on sort of higher dimensions. I know that we've had, we've had talks um, already for surfaces. So here the results will hold, but, but uh, they're, not, they're not necessarily the best ones. Okay, so I think that's all I wanted to say in terms of announcements. So um, forgive me for the next couple of slides where I'm just going to remind you of the Steckler problem, mostly so that I can um, fix my notation. So here, um, here today in this talk, we'll have uh, Riemannian manifolds denoted M with Riemannian metric G, and the dimension will be at least two, and then the boundary is always denoted sigma, it will be assumed to be smooth. And then, of course, the Steckler eigenvalue problem is where we search for harmonic, harmonic functions on M, so that on the boundary sigma, the normal derivative is proportional to the function itself. And this um, constant of proportionality, if you like, it's the Steckler eigenvalue. And it's well known in in this setting that the step club eigenvalues form a discrete sequence. Um, the first one I'll denote it by sigma zero, it's zero, and then sigma one will be the first non-zero eigenvalue. And of course we know as well that the only point of accumulation is at plus infinity. Um, and like we heard in the other talks, the, the step club parameter, it's, it's occurring in the boundary condition. So um, as we've seen, there's, there is a strong relationship between the, the boundary and the step of eigenvalues, and we'll see that also coming across in the bounds that we present here. Um, so having in mind that I'm going to look at upper bounds, um, I will be needing to, to bound the Rayleigh quotient. So let me remind you what the Rayleigh quotient is in this setting. So for a Sobolev function u in h1, um, the Rayleigh quotient for the Steckler problem is in the denominator. In the numerator, we have uh, the L2 norm of the gradient of u, the L2 norm squared of the gradient of u, and then in the denominator we have the L2 norm of u squared. But in the denominator, it's only on the boundary. 
And then if I'm looking at the non-zero Steckler eigenvalues, I can um, consider the characterization given as a min-max, where I look among Sobolev functions that are orthogonal to constants on the boundary. Okay, so that's going to come back up later. Um, one thing that's going to be with us sort of throughout the whole discussion actually is the asymptotics for, for the Steckler eigenvalues, or more precisely, the exponent of k, which uh, the leading order exponent here. So we know that the, the leading order asymptotics are given as here that we have a constant uh, depending on the dimension and on sigma, the boundary. And then k we're coming with power one over n minus one. So one over the dimension of the boundary as k tends to infinity. So this will be an important um, quantity in the rest of the talk, at least this one over n minus one. So uh, please, please commit it to memory. And uh, if you didn't already have it um, as your usual uh, asymptotics. So I'm gonna talk about upper bounds. And actually um, there will be two questions that I would like to consider, but before I do that, I should motivate them. So in the next couple of slides, I will uh, present some results for uh, some upper bounds which um, gave us the motivation for the for these um, questions and so one thing which might come to mind already if you're not if you're not um, familiar with with this particular um, problem or with upper bounds for them is whether or not it's meaningful to even ask whether whether there are upper bounds just for an arbitrary Romanian manifold so the first result that I wanted to, to recall for you is uh, this one due to Colvoil de Supian where we're looking at um, Romanian manifolds of dimension at least three, and uh, it has a metric G on it, and we suppose the boundary has B components. Um, and so the question is, if I fix the boundary, is that enough of a constraint to obtain upper bounds? And actually, um, they they showed that no, this isn't this isn't quite enough because even if you fix the boundary, um, you can find a family of metrics so that uh, they agree on the boundary, they agree outside some some tubular neighborhood of the boundary, um, but you can perturb the metric in a small neighborhood of the boundary and make the b plus first and larger eigenvalues as large as you want. And if you would like to even uh, make the first non-zero one as big as you want, then you need to um, perturb the metric also in, also uh, inside the manifold and further in than, than this small neighborhood of the boundary. So fixing the boundary on its own isn't necessarily enough to obtain upper bounds. So I need to have that in mind when I'm looking for um, how I can obtain, how I can obtain an upper bound. So now the question is, which constraints can we impose in order to get upper bounds? And later we'll try to think as well on um, how good is my up, upper bound in terms of if I change the metric or if I, uh, if I change the ambient space and so on. But first of all, what do we need to do to get upper bounds? Um, so one of the first results in that direction um, was due to Colbert, Sufi and Chihuahua also, but it was actually um, a few years earlier, six years earlier in 2011. And there they consider M to be a, a manifold which is conformally equivalent to a complete manifold, which has non-negative Ricci curvature. And what they showed is that for any domain in this manifold, sigma K times uh, volume of sigma to the one over M minus one um, so I should have said, well, we had the problem on the slide, but this is the um, scaling invariant eigenvalue. So this quantity, it's bounded from above by some dimensional constant divided by the isoparametric ratio times k to the two over n. And here the isoparametric ratio is uh, the volume of the boundary divided by the volume of omega to some appropriate power. Okay. Um, and I should mention as well that this, there was some uh, asthma Hassanitad also treated the case where the Ricci curvature is bounded from below, but maybe negative. Um, so what, what I would like to observe 
from this result is that um, even though we have some, in some sense, quite strong constraints, so we have a metric constraint and a curvature constraint here, we get an upper bound, which is great, but the power here is, is, not, um, is not agreeing with the asymptotics in this particular case. And I think there was some discussion of this in a recent paper by Alexandre and John as well. So we, one question which we could ask at this point is what kind, what kind of constraints do I need to impose in order to get the optimal exponent of K? Uh, remember that, that optimal exponent, the magic number is one over N minus one. So that's what we'll have a think about now. How can I obtain the optimal exponents or is it even possible? Um, thankfully it is and the compelling result in that direction is Peter Provenzano and Stube where they consider Euclidean domains bounded with connected boundary class C2. And they were able to obtain bounds of the following form where um, sigma K is bounded, its bound is related to the Laplace eigenvalues on the boundary sigma. So sigma is, is a closed manifold. There was no boundary condition on the boundary. Um, but what you'll remember is that sigma is M minus one dimensional. And we have the vial asymptotics for lambda k. So lambda k is behaving like uh, two, k to the 2 over n minus 1 as k goes to infinity. So asymptotically, we would have the optimal exponent here of k. Um, and actually, they, they obtain as a corollary of these results a, an upper bound of this form, where we have uh, the second term looking like um, similar to the asymptotics k over volume of sigma to the to the optimal power for some dimensional constant, which is um, of course bigger than the asymptotic constant. And then there is this first uh, quantity here, which has quite a complicated dependence on, on the geometry. So it depends on the principal curvatures of sigma, the rolling radius of omega, and also the Ricci curvature of sigma. But on the bright side, you can get a bound with optimal exponent, but you do need these strong um, these strong curvature constraints on both the boundary and on, um, on the domain itself in, in this case. And just to mention, there were generalizations and extensions of this to the Riemannian, to some Riemannian settings. Uh, so first of all, Jung in 2018, uh, considered the case of an open set with convex C2 boundary in a complete manifold. And on the manifold, there were some additional um, hypotheses. So on the sectional curvature and also on the second fundamental form. And then there was a further extension by uh, Kolba Jihuad and Heshanisad in 2020 for similar, similar constraints to the case of Provinciano Stube. Um, so rolling radius and uh, principal curvatures of the boundary and sectional curvatures here. And what they obtained was, was analogous results to, to these here from which you can obtain upper bounds um, with an optimal exponent of K, but you pay a price uh, in the geometry there. Okay, so, so far I hope what the conclusion is, is that if, I want, if I'm looking at an optimal exponent, then I'm gonna have to put quite strong um, curvature conditions on, oh, or at least no, if I put strong curvature conditions, then I can have an optimal exponent. So then we have a slightly different um, perspective if we instead look at submanifolds in Euclidean space. So now I'm going to take sigma, some fixed uh, N minus one dimensional, a closed submanifold, and M will be a manifold in, in RM, some Euclidean space with boundary sigma. And then what we were able to show with uh, Colbois and Jehoir was that the Steklov eigenvalues in that case, they're bounded by some constant depending only on sigma times the volume of M and then times K to the two over N minus one. And now there's quite a few remarks to make. So, uh, the good news, or a good news, is that there's no dependence on the curvature of the manifold. But I'm sure you've already spotted it. The less good news is that the exponent's not optimal with respect to the asymptotics. Um, and actually, this A of sigma, it's rather complicated. 
So it has a quite strong dependence on sigma. Um, it we'd be happy with the dependent. We're happy with the dependence on uh, the volume, but it also depends on the Ricci curvature, the diameter, the number of connected components, and the distortion. Um, and I just recall for you here what the definition of distortion is. So for a connected submanifold N, the distortion is the supremum uh, of the quotient distance, geodesic distance in, in N divided by the norm in, um, of X minus Y, the Euclidean norm. So what you um, can see here is this constant A of sigma, it, it is quite complicated. Um, the Ricci curvature is not necessarily the most pleasant quantity to have to deal with and looking at the distortion, uh, that one isn't either. Um, of course, the, the Ricci curvature, it's not so robust if I change the metric. So essentially what we would like to do now is two things. Um, one of them would be to try to understand better which of the quantities related to sigma are, are the most um, the most relevant to to obtaining these upper bounds. Um, so, is there is there a simpler way? Can we express a sigma or a, find a bound for a sigma in terms of some simpler invariants that are more robust than Ricci curvature and um, more easy to understand or more easy to uh, compute or estimate than the distortion. And then on the other side, we would also like to have a bound with optimal exponent, or at least to understand, is there some geometric situation in which it's possible? So these, this uh, result is actually motivating our two key questions. So for the rest of the talk, I will be working with um, a Riemannian manifold in as a submanifold of Euclidean space. And I want to know whether I can find upper bounds for the eigenvalues that depend on some geometric invariants that are more robust than Ricci curvature and more easy to compute and understand than distortion. And then in, on, in the other strand, um, are there bounds with optimal exponent of K or in which situation can I have these bounds? Okay. So um, let me then try to answer some of these questions. D before I go on, does anybody have any comment or question? Okay, great. It's very quiet out here. So then um, let's try to answer these questions. So uh, first of all, with um, Colbois and Jihua, we were able to find um, in the particular case of hypersurfaces in Euclidean space, we were able to find a simpler bound, uh, so a simpler bound for, for the Steckler eigenvalues where there's less, um, less or no dependence on curvature. So let's be more precise. So I take sigma this time, it's um, a smooth hypersurface in, in Euclidean space Rn, and omega is gonna be the Euclidean domain bounded by sigma. And then um, I take M to be a manifold with boundary sigma and we can bound sigma M by some dimensional constant. We have the volume of M on the volume of this domain omega and then K to the two on N minus one. And we see that this result doesn't depend on the curvatures of M or on the Ricci curvature of sigma or the diameter or distortion of sigma. But again, it doesn't have the the optimal um, exponent in terms of the asymptotics. And so now we might wonder, is it possible to obtain, um, with some more constraints, can we obtain the optimal um, power of K? And the answer is yes, if we also impose um, a metric constraint. So if instead of just a hypersurface, we consider a hypersurface of revolution, um, then we can obtain a bound with optimal exponent. And uh, what I mean by hypersurface of revolution is that the metric will have the form um, dr squared plus h squared g0, where g0 is the metric on, on the ball. So here we have no dependence on curvatures, Ricci curvature, diameter or distortion of sigma. 
the exponent of k is optimal with respect to the asymptotics, um, but unfortunately the bound was not sharp. Um, actually, to obtain it, we we did a comparison with um, the mixed the mixed Dirichlet Steckler uh, problem on on a cylinder, and there was some leeway with with the length of the cylinder, so you could choose it depending on on your problem. Um, but the good news is that in a recent paper, um, Bruno Colbois and Sheila Verma, they have obtained an upper bound for the Steckler eigenvalues of hypersurfaces of revolution in, in Euclidean space. Okay. So, um, so if we think now, we started out with um, with bound with quite strong constraints on curvature. And we got to see there that in that case, I can have bounds with optimal exponents. Um, then when we changed our perspective slightly, we got bounds with uh, less dependence on curvature and not quite optimal bound unless you have other, other kinds of constraints like here with a metric constraint. What we're gonna do now is try and look at a different invariance and see um, what we can glean from, from this other perspective. So. Actually, we'll we'll now consider an extrinsic invariant, which is which we'll call the intersection index, and I believe it's used um, more widely. I mean, um, been used more widely in, in in several areas of mathematics, but here in spectral geometry, um, it was used it by uh, Colbois, Dryden, and El Sufi in two thousand and ten, where they obtained some upper bounds for Laplace eigenvalues of closed manifolds. Um, so I'm going to follow, follow their definition here. So um, if I take n some submanifold of dimension q in our q plus p, then by transversality, almost every p plane is transverse to n. So that if I look at the intersection of n with that plane, it consists of a finite number of points. And then we define the intersection index of n to be the supremum over all planes that are transverse to n. So the supremum number of points over all p planes transverse to n. Okay, so um, I'm going to just on the next slide do a brief example so that we can have an example in mind for the rest if we like and hopefully get a better feeling of this definition as well. So let's just take the case where sigma is an algebraic hypersurface in Rn. Uh, then we have that sigma is the zero set of a polynomial P, where P is a multivariate polynomial here. And since we're interested in a hypersurface, the index that we're looking at is given as the supremum over all lines transverse to sigma. And we look at the number of intersections of these lines with sigma. But of course, what if I take the equation of the line and substitute into the polynomial, uh, then I end up with a polynomial in one variable. And I know that the number of zeros is bounded by the degree. So the index itself in this case is bounded by the degree of the polynomial. And of course, you could um, extend this, this scheme to algebraic varieties uh, in higher dimensions. So then the index would be bounded by the product of the degrees of the polynomials, which were defining these, these um, varieties. And if you're interested, you can have a look in the article of Colbois, Dryden and El Sufi where they, where they make use of this. Um, and another, well, another case where we can see easily what the index is, is if I suppose additionally that sigma is convex, then the index will of course be two. Uh, so in this in this example, the, the index um, is not so difficult to estimate. On the other hand, um, it could be very difficult to to compute for such a hypersurface the distortion and the Ricci curvature. So, if we we're able to get bounds in terms of the index, then uh, hopefully that would give rise to a a nice um, bound for this constant a sigma that had a lot of dependence on a lot of um, potentially less pleasant and less robust terms. So here is our first result in terms of the intersection index. 
So we take a sigma n minus one dimensional closed smooth submanifold in Euclidean space and m a manifold with boundary sigma. And then we were able to show that there is some constant. Uh, the constant is dependent on both the dimension of m and on the dimension of the ambient space, such that the Steklov eigenvalues are bounded like this. So we have the dimensional constant, then the index to the power two on m minus one, volume of m and sigma to some power and k to the two on n minus one. And now what we can see is that the bound here has much simpler dependence on sigma than A of sigma. There's no uh, Ritchie curvature distortion um, or, or any of the others. The number of boundary components also doesn't matter here in some sense. I mean, yeah, it depends what you think about the index. Um, and also on the downside, the exponent isn't optimal. So that's something we would still like to address. But before we do that, um, I'm just going to slightly rewrite the, the bound that you see here by taking one power of uh, sig volume sigma to the one over m minus one to the other side, um, because then this possibly looks more uh, reminiscent of the previous result that we showed um, due to uh, Colbois and Sufian Jihuar involving, in that case, the isoparametric ratio of a domain. And um, so it's kind of in the same spirit here apart from the power is now two over n minus one rather than two over n. So it's so it's slightly uh, worse. Um, and we have this intersection index coming in, but we're not requiring um, to be conformally equivalent to, to a, complete met, a complete manifold or any Ritchie curvature constraints. And uh, one thing you could possibly notice is that when this um, ratio should be big is exactly when the volume here would be large compared to the volume of M, but that's what's prevented by the index, um, which we'll see in, in a moment. Okay, so where we are is we have a bound for the eigenvalues, which um, has simpler dependence than A of sigma on the boundary, but we still don't have an optimal exponent. So now we would like to ask, can we use the index to help us get an optimal exponent? Is there some geometric situation in which we can obtain a bound with, with k to the one over n minus one? And thankfully the answer is yes, um, or else that would be a bad question for me to ask in the middle of my talk. So here is our result. Um, we keep sigma as before, closed smooth submanifold. And now we introduce the injectivity radius of sigma. So we'll denote that by R0. And then for any manifold with boundary sigma, um, we actually obtain a bound of the following form. So um, if you look first at the second term, so we have a constant depending only on n. So not like um, in the previous result where there was the two dimensions coming into the game, just one of them. But then there is the index of m, index of sigma, but uh, we have exactly the right power of k and the right power of the volume of sigma. So here, um, this is looking more like the asymptotic term apart from these indices. But then we also have a first term. And it seems we pay a price um, here of one over the, the injectivity radius. And so I could imagine if you're um, sat at the other side of your screen looking at this, then maybe your que first question now uh, could be, is it really necessary to have the first term? Uh, do we really need to involve this, this term here involving the, in the injectivity radius? And in dimension four or higher, the answer is yes. Um, so we were able to construct an example to show that actually the first term is necessary in this case. Um, and roughly speaking, the, the motivation is coming from having, um, if we had a very long thing set and lots of the volume uh, close to the boundary. So if, so that would be more the motivation, but to, in practice, um, if you have a chance to look at the paper, you'll see the example is rather, rather complicated. Um, but 
so yeah, if you have any comment about that, uh, don't hesitate to get in touch with us, we'd be happy to hear it. So anyway, the main thing is that we have um, the second part comes k to the one over n minus one, and then the first part is necessary in dimension four and higher. Okay. And uh, some, some further um, good news is that we have a corollary of this, this result too, which is for the special case of hypersurfaces in Euclidean space. So if we come back to assuming sigma is a hypersurface, then you see that we actually have no, um, no dependence on M anymore. So maybe if I just go back one, uh, in both terms here, the index of M was coming into the game. But when I'm in the case of hypersurfaces, there's no longer any index of M. So we only have the index of the boundary. And this one is in the same kind of spirit as the results that I mentioned right at the beginning by Provinciano and Stube, where there is um, a term K on volume sigma with appropriate power, where a in, we're all, also involved in the intersection index, and then there's, there's a first quantity which depends on injectivity radius rather than Ricci curvature and other curvatures. Okay, and um, so what I would like to do now is to um, talk through with you some of the details of the proof and hopefully show the benefit of bringing the injectivity radius into the, into the game. Um, so that's hopefully what I will get across in the next couple of slides. Um, so what we, what we want to do is obtain these upper bounds. And so we'll use the fairly classical approach that we wish to obtain a disjoint collection of sets um, on which, on these sets, we're going to define an appropriate test function and then we'll approximate the, we'll bound the Rayleigh quotient for these test functions. So as it turns out, one thing which is uh, useful, or at least for the strategy we're using, which will be important, is to have some control on um, the volume of sigma or m intersection with a ball. And so uh, there is a there is there are ways to measure this volume, and actually the index is um, allowing us to to measure that. So if I just recall for you here, um, a result of Colbert, Dryden, and El Sufi, and I promise we'll see on the next slide where it, where it's used. Um, but if you're used to these these considerations, you might already have an idea. So in any case, for a compact immersed submanifold n dimension q in our q plus p. We have that the volume of n intersect a ball rate of radius r is bounded by some constant times r to the q. So we have um, control on the volume of balls here. And the index is so so um, if I assume the index is bounded, then um, we're prevented from having n concentrating in some small region. So of course, here if, if this is bounded then for some small ball, I can't have a lot of N inside there. So I can't have um, N with lots of wrinkles inside the ball. And how we're gonna use this um, is for both Sigma and M. So for Sigma, remember it's the boundary, it's N minus one dimensional. So we'll have a control, a if you like a local control on the volume of Sigma intersected a ball in terms of the index of sigma, and we get the power r to the n minus one. And then um, for m, similar story, the volume of m intersect a ball is bounded by some constant times r to the n. And notice that if we each time we use these, the index of the respective um, manifold will, will come into the game with the power r to its dimension. Okay, so let's then apply the classic strategy that we, let's suppose we have some disjoint sets on which to start the process. So I'm going to choose a radius R and then 
um, for the time being, ask you to believe me that there is a ball, there is a collection. Uh, so I take sigma k, there is a collection of k plus one balls of radius 2r, which are disjoint, um, such that I can apply this strategy that I'm about to apply. So I have some balls, they're um, radius 2r, and we're, on each of those, we're going to define a test function, which is supported on b of radius 2r, and it's defined as, as given here. So you can see that if x is inside the ball bxi of radius r, then, then um, we'll recover back 1, gi will be 1. If it's outside of the ball of radius 2r, then it will be 0. And then on the, um, on the annulus of radius r, the function is decreasing to 0. And remember, we want to bound the Rayleigh quotient. So um, we see that, of course, the norm of the gradient of gi squared is bounded by 1 over r squared almost everywhere in the ball. So for the numerator of the Rayleigh quotient, it was the integral on m of the gradient gi squared. So this can be bounded by the volume of m intersected with a ball on r squared. But this volume m intersection with a ball is exactly how we know how to control this, or we have a means of controlling it by the results of Colbois, Dryden, and Elzupi. So we can bound it like a constant times r to the n. And the constant that comes into the game now is the intersection index of m times r to the n minus 2. So then if we look for the denominator uh, in the Rayleigh quotient, we'd like to bound um, the integral on sigma of gi squared. And we use that gi is 1 on the ball of radius r. So we're interested now in the volume of sigma intersecting with a ball. And remember what we would like to obtain is a bound with, power, with k to the power 1 over n minus 1. So if I want k to the 1 over n minus 1 and I look here at my radius, um, then what I'd really like in the bound for the Rayleigh quotient is actually 1 over the radius. So I, I would really like to have 1 over the radius so that my Rayleigh quotient is bounded by something times k to the 1 over n minus 1. So that means what I need to have is the volume of sigma intersect the ball is bounded from below by c times r to the n minus 1, because I've got this r to the n minus 2 in the numerator. OK, so where we're up to is I have um, selected a radius. I'm assuming there are a disjoint set of k plus 1 balls of radius 2r, and on each of these I can define a test function, and then I can approximate the Rayleigh quotient in this way, which would give me k to the 1 over n minus 1, provided that this inequality here in blue can be satisfied. So now the question is whether or not I can um, satisfy this inequality. And it turns out that we can, but this is exactly where we bring in the injectivity radius. And um, so it's actually coming from a result of Krog. So if I look at the, the Romanian ball, so the ball met, given by metric G, a uh, distance induced by the metric G, uh, then that's contained in the Euclidean ball. And on the uh, Romanian ball, if the radius is smaller or equal than the injectivity radius on two, then we have that the volume sigma intersect this geodesic ball is bounded from below by exactly the form that we want. And then, of course, the Euclidean volume is also bounded from above as well. So in the situation where this, um, where the radius of the balls that I started with is bounded from above by the injectivity radius on two, I get exactly the constant, uh, exactly the power of R that I like, so that in the Rayleigh quotient here, I can end up with one over R. Um, but now the problem is, how do I satisfy the condition that R, the radius, is less or equal than the injectivity radius R0 over 2? So if you look at my choice of R, I need to have that this is bounded from above by R0 over 2. So essentially what I'm saying is, if I take K big enough, 
then I have a bound of the required form. And the point is that if for a smaller k, that's where I have to pay the price and pick up the term one over the injectivity radius. So, um, so to bound the sigma k, I need to have k plus one balls of radius two r, r bounded by r zero one two to apply the strategy. The second term comes precisely from employing this result of Krug. And the first term comes because we can only employ that result for k big enough. Um, and maybe one more comment uh, on this proof. If you notice um, on the previous slide, so in the estimation of the upper bound of the Rayleigh quotients, that's where this index comes into the game because I want to bound the volume of M intersection with a ball. That's where the index comes in. If I think instead about the case of hypersurfaces, so we said if sigma is a hypersurface, um, then we can instead use that the volume of M intersected with the ball is bounded like, well, by the volume times radius to N. So there won't be any IM in that case. There's no, there's no index coming in. So that's why in the hypersurface case, we had the result where only the index of sigma um, came in and not, not the index of M. Okay, so what we've seen then is if I am able to start with, with a collection of balls and to use the index to control locally the volume, then I can pick up the optimal exponent. So let me just say a couple of words about the other results. So remember, maybe I should show it again. So remember we had the proof that we just talked about was for this one where the power of k is optimal and injectivity radius is there. But we also had this um, other result, which was in a similar spirit to Colbois, Soupy and Jehoar. Um, and also Colbois, Jehoar and myself, where instead of the A sigma, we had index, um, index coming into the game. So let's say a few words about that. Apologies for the clicking. OK, so um, this time, in it, turns out that in the ball, starting with the balls um, doesn't actually help us to win because of course there where we won was we took into account the injectivity radius and we don't want to do that now. So instead we need to find another way of generating a disjoint collection of sets. Um, and I could imagine if, you, if you're familiar with these kinds of results, then you've already seen this and otherwise perhaps Perhaps you haven't seen it before. So I'll, I'll mention very briefly what we'll use to obtain our sets. So I'm, it's a result of Colby and Mayotten, um, where we start with some metric measured space, x, d, and mu. And we assume that there is a packing constant c, so that for every ball of radius r, we can cover it by c balls of radius r over 2. And then if uh, the measure of a ball of radius r is bounded in this way, then you can show that there are exactly k subsets such that they're not too small in measure and the distance between them is at least 3r. Now in our case, uh, the x is just rm, the packing constant, you can take it to be 32 to the m. Um, and we pick k to be 2k plus 2 if we want to bound sigma k. Um, and then the measure that we consider, it's, it's the volume of sigma intersect O. So if you think about the condition that needs to be satisfied here in the middle, then I'm looking at um, the volume sigma intersect the ball BXR. And we know how to bound that because we have the result of Colbois, Dryden and El-Sufi. So there's going to be some index cropping up there. So the, so the plan is we need to satisfy this inequality to get hold of our sets. And to do that, um, I choose an appropriate R so that this volume is satisfied, and this, this inequality is satisfied by using the result of Colbois, Dryden, and El Sufi. That gives me um, the K plus two sets such that the each AI, it's not too small in, in measure, and um, the distance between the AIs is at least three R. 
so that if I then enlarge each of the AIs, if I take an R tubular neighborhood of each one, then these R neighborhoods are still disjoint. And then on each of those R neighborhoods, I define a test function as before. So it's one in AI, it's zero outside of AIR, and it's decreasing on the R neighborhood. And then if we come back again and um, try to estimate the Rayleigh quotient, then in the numerator we have similarly to before, the volume M intersect AIR, where AIR is not necessarily a ball anymore, uh, divided by R squared. And in the denominator, we use that GI is one on AI, and the lower bound comes from colborne mayerton And notice now that the lower bound doesn't depend on R at all. Um, and so then if we want to give an upper bound for this volume here, we can choose K plus one of the sets. So there are K plus one of them so that this volume is bounded by the volume of M on K plus one. And what you see at the end of the story is that we have a bound for the Rayleigh quotient like this, where the two K plus two, the, the K plus one out of there is gonna cancel with this K plus one. So the only place where K comes into the game is in R squared. And if I just go back and look what one over R squared looks like, that's where I'm getting hold of K to the two over N minus one. Okay, so um, it was helpful in the previous setting that we had we could appeal to the injectivity radius to allow us um, more, to allow us to obtain the, the order of growth we would like here. Um, but on the bright side here, we haven't appealed to the index of M to bound this term. Okay, so, so that's roughly the strategies of the proofs for those two results. Um, and one thing which hopefully, hopefully was, um, was clear was that in, in, the, in the first result that we proved, so the one involving injectivity radius, um, rather than take all of the volume of the manifold into account, we somehow take a local, a local approach. We look at a ball of radius R and we use the index M to sort of avoid any um, concentration. Whereas in the, in the uh, result that we just talked about now, the proof we just talked about, there was the whole volume of M present in the game. Um, so actually, and, and so with that, in that respect, we have the whole volume of M with this power to an M minus one. And here we have the, the index only, but no volume, not the whole volume um, and the optimal power. Naturally, this seems um, to be a more general phenomenon from the following point of view. So if I take a manifold um, Riemannian manifold of dimension N, Mg, the smooth boundary sigma. And if I assume that I have a bound for sigma K uh, of this form, so I have some constant depending on the dimension, then the volume of sigma to some power, the volume of M to some power, K to some power, alpha, beta, gamma are all positive, and gamma is chosen so that if I was to multiply throughout by um, volume sigma to the one over m minus one, everything is dimensionally invariant, so we can pick gamma appropriately. And then what we were able to show with, with Bruno Colbois was that we could, uh, for any such manifold, we can find a metric G so that uh, this inequality here is satisfied. So one plus beta is bounded from above by alpha times n minus one. And what you notice is if beta is strictly positive, then alpha will be strictly greater than one over m minus one. So if sigma, uh, if we choose the metric appropriately and sigma is satisfying a bound like this, then when the volume is present, there's no chance that K can appear with the optimal exponent. So it seems in very roughly speaking way that um, the presence of the volume, all of the volume of sigma is posing some sort of obstruction to having the optimal exponents. And I think um, the optimal exponent was, was um, studied in more generality by Alexander and John in, a, in one of their recent works on homogenization. So 
maybe they would like to say something about that um, at the end. But I just have uh, one slide left actually, which is um, to say, uh, so at this here ends the discussion on upper bounds. And I just wanted to say a couple of words about lower bounds. So um, I'm probably you're already a bit familiar with this, that in general for the lower bounds, the situation is more complicated and it's uh, very tricky to get hold of, upper, of lower bounds. And there are some known bounds by Escobar and Pierre Jam for the first non-zero uh, Steckler eigenvalue bounds of Chiga type. And then these were generalized by Asmai Sanisad and Lohanito um, to higher eigenvalues. And I think if I remember correctly, in each of those papers, they give examples of settings where the bound itself is very small, even though the eigenvalues are not. So the, the lower bounds in this sense are quite tricky. Um, so if you impose sufficient number of constraints, you can get sharper bounds. For example, with uh, Colbois, Giroir and, and myself, um, for hypersurfaces of revolution, so remember that was um, the metric of the form dr squared plus h squared g0, g0 the metric on the ball. Um, if I have a hypersurface of a revolution with fixed boundary and either one or two boundary components, then I can get lower bounds that are even sharp. Uh, so for one boundary component, it was achieved by a ball and two boundary components with this joint union of two balls. Um, but in that paper, at the time of writing, we were not sure whether having a submanifold of Euclidean space with fixed boundary was sufficient number of conditions to guarantee that the eigenvalues would be bounded from below, or whether in that case you could still have small eigenvalues. And then this was resolved um, by colbois and Antoine Metras. Uh, they actually constructed an example of a submanifold in Euclidean space with fixed boundary, but the, with small Steklov eigenvalues. And um, one thing which is interesting about the, the construction there, and I, I'm going to um, use the same words that they used to describe it, is that they have, they, I, if I understood correctly, the inspiration was to have a submanifold that's very wrinkly. So it folds on itself a lot. Uh, they picture it as an accordion. Um, so one thing that I was wondering is whether or not if you stick in this setting of submanifold in Euclidean space with fixed boundary, but you add in um, a constraint on the index, could you obtain a meaningful lower bound or can you still have small eigenvalues? Because of course this kind of um, accordion behavior would have a big index. So that's a question that I'll leave you with. And I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Katie, for this uh, nice talk. Thank you. Um, we have time for questions. If some of you have questions, you can either um, speak up or write them in the chat. So I, I, I'd have one question if I, if I can. Yeah. Um, so you, you, you mentioned um, that uh, you, you have examples where that first number is, is necessary when n is greater or equal to four. We know it's not if n is um, two. What about n is three? Like what was the obstruction in n is three for? Uh... Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um... Whether there's an obstruction or not, I don't know. The issue, the reason why we have the dimension four actually comes from the construction that we had. So um, what, what we did was to take, um, to take an annulus mm -hmm. um, and on the interior um, sphere, we put a Steklov condition and the exterior one, we put a Neumann condition. And then of course, when you, so we're interested in making the injectivity radius very small, so a shrink in the inner one. Mm -hmm. um, but we also need that the boundary, the volume of the boundary doesn't become small because that's also appearing in the second term in the K over volume of the boundary. So we crossed it with a circle to be able to preserve the volume of the boundary. Um, mm -hmm. But I think in going up to, in going up to this dimension in some sense, um, 
is what's stopping us from treating the third case as well. Okay. Yeah. But feel free to have a look if you have a chance and, and let us know if, if you have any yeah, uh, question I mean, or insight. Yeah. Thank you, Jean. Any, uh, anyone else have uh, questions or comments? Well, I, I have one myself, but uh, it's a bit cheating. So, do you know <laughs> how much of this could go through uh, in, in ambient manifolds that are not RN? Ah, uh, like how um, is the RN used in the in the proofs, especially the the later proofs that are new? That's a really good question. Thank you. Um, I think if I understand correctly, it's used in these um, in these bounds on the volume control for the in terms of the index. So for the control of um, the, the submanifold intersection with the ball, I think it's there where you need RM. If I remember correctly from our paper with you, Alexandre, we needed Richie curvature to get yeah. at the, yeah, to get at the others. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. If not, let's thank Katie again. Thank you. Thank you.